together. Uh, Pastor Al and, and Laura have really become like family members to us here at Harvest Time. They've been with us several times over the last few years, and he has a word from the Lord to share with us. I, I wonder if you'd stand on your feet this morning, and would you give your best welcome for our friends, Pastor Al and Laura Robbins. Amen. You may be seated. You may want to come back to the third story of the third service because that football story gets bigger and bigger. <laughs> now the uniforms would fall right off you if you got hit. By next, that was the best equipment I could get you guys. Come on. And we only did it because I wanted to play. And frankly, I still want to play, but... Maybe I could try out for the Cleveland Browns. I don't know. They might. I could be a kicker or something. I would be willing to sit on the bench just to be there. But it's great to be back with you again. Uh, we haven't been here since July. I looked it up. And we were here in July, although we travel a lot. We're between pastorates right now. And we travel preaching and doing antiques, and we build repurposed furniture and repurposed signs on antique lumber. My wife does that. I don't touch anything with paint. It makes a mess. Uh, and God's helped us. Each year it's gotten a little better, but that's not our vision and dream and our plan, and we're just believing God's got some, some other things. But when we drive through, we try to, if it'll work, we try to get here and see the progress out back, and I'll talk... I'll talk about that later, but we're so excited to pull in. Uh, man, a few months ago we came through, I think in October, and it was so early in the morning, no one was here yet, but we had to get a picture of the cross out front. <coughs> it's just gorgeous what God is doing. I'm going to talk more about that as we go on, but I want to thank you for all your prayers and to inspire hope for anybody who's battling any health issues. But uh, my, my wife, finally, after a three-year battle, was able to ring the bell in the oncology ward. So would you just stand and wave? Amen. And, you know, we just sold our house last week. We don't even know where we're going. We're open to what God has next. And... Uh, we just keep saying, you know, we have each other, and we're so grateful for that. We have so many friends that are widows and widowers, and I don't know. Pastor, I don't know why God has given me that gift, but the rest doesn't matter. Nothing else matters, you know. Uh, listen to that song on repeat this morning, Crowns. Anybody know that song? I think it was on a recent Hill song. I'll listen to that for hours. You know, that, that, that's what I have. And uh, it's hard. It'd be hard to get rid of her. I've had notes from her since she was 11 and I was 12. We still have one. And uh, you know, we, d we dated other people in high school, but Finally, she got her head screwed on. And <laughs> knew what a great catch I was. <laughs> Actually, God told her she was experienced. She was from a very stable six-sibling family. And uh, I was from a broken home that I didn't even know <laughs> what to do. But uh, we still have it. It says, we still have the note in our fireproof file. It says... Uh, do you like me, Mary, or Beth? Circle one. <laughs> I've been circling her ever since, and I'm going to be coming in for a landing soon. I have still weighing my options. <laughs> Last August 6th, we've been married for 40 years. And <clears throat> I know we look so much younger. We look so much younger that we married at age six. No, just kidding, but... <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, back when we knew everything, we married at 18. She had turned 18 a month before we got married. And our big honeymoon was $100 at a campground up in northern Maine, Frost Pond. And we came home and we had money left. 
and we weren't in debt like a lot of couples. No, we're going to West whatever it is and eight million in debt and we had a good time, but there was nothing great that mattered anyway except each other. So, and we've had more than our share of great stays. In fact, yesterday, the hotel you guys put us in, I love a hot tub. In fact, when we look for a new house, I don't even need a bedroom or anything. If there's a hot tub, we're buying it. Got a lot of arthritis and injuries, you know, back, boy, what am I now, 59. When I was 45, I was still bench pressing 400 with no lift off, nothing. I love it. Leg pressing, 1135, three reps. You know how, see, even old preachers, our stories get bigger and bigger. Anyway, it was really like 125. No, just kidding, but. It was big enough that my son is bigger than me. And recently I said, Alan, if you, if you let me train you, I can get you to a 500 bench. And I said, yeah, let's go for it, Dad. He said, he burst out laughing, saying, why, Dad? So I'll have a plastic trophy in my shed and not able to reach my pillow at night. So, so hot tub for joints and arthritis and injuries. I was in that thing 45 minutes yesterday. And, and then they had a, you swim below, and then you go outside. And I hate the cold. I've lived in New England my whole life. The cold is of the devil, in my opinion. <laughs> and I trusted you guys. I trusted Pastor to book me that it would be warmer, because we're like five hours south. And it was just as bad this morning. I was walking to the truck. I don't like valet parking. I was walking up to the back parking lot. Had her stay inside, and I'm saying, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs> because we sold our house, and she was in Vegas visiting our daughter the last few days, this guy packed all our winter clothes. So I'm out there in a vest this morning. Uh, Deb Petfield said, hey, I thought you were trying to be a tough guy from Maine. I said, no, <laughs> all our jackets, I'm not buying another jacket now. Come on, this can't last forever. And that's what I said a month ago, but anyway. So a hot tub man, I, I did more swimming yesterday afternoon than I've done in five years, I told my wife. And I got brave enough to swim under the wall and go out in the heated pool on the outside. And got a, a guy took a couple pictures of me with snow behind me. <laughs> Sent them to my kids. They know, they said, Dad, no, that's not you. You wouldn't do that. I did it, man. And I think it affected my sinuses last night because you had to keep putting your head under water. The pool was hot. You could have made a, you know, French onion soup in there if you wanted to. But, uh, but you get your head above the water and your head was like, I told my granddaughter, my head kept falling off, frozen. I had to keep attaching it. So actually, I'm preaching backwards right now. Just kidding. Anyway. All right, we've warmed up enough uh, uh, in, in the spirit. So, look, we're going to Mark chapter 2. I'm grateful to be here. I appreciate Pastor Glenn. I appreciate Pastor Nick, Pastor Faith. Pastor Kimmy, is she away? Or? I didn't get to see her. Oh, Stanford campus. I got to see that sometime. I, I love the theater stuff. We tried it and it didn't work. That's how we closed our last church because it ended up just the old theater, the heating system was like five grand a minute just to get it up. We'd get that heated up to temperature, 1800s building, we'd get it up to temperature, and it would, it hit, would hit, when the pastor said, in conclusion, then we finally got it warm enough, and people were dropping like flies. So we got out of there, but I'd love to see that pastor and want to see out front. We're grateful to be here, and I know God's laid something on my heart this morning. <clears throat> we know that uh, without him, it's all a waste anyway. Coming here is a waste. Uh, we need Jesus. So, Father, we thank you for your word today. We trust you, God. We, we do agree with that song, Crowns, that it's all you. Uh, our life is in the Lord. And the rest is just accessories and draperies and baggage and optional and we're so grateful for your presence here today from walking driving on the campus from uh, all the people we meet the greeters those that are serving behind the scenes the staff team the from those that make the coffee to those that vacuum the hallways god thank you for having assembled 
an amazing team. I pray, God, that the team of workers would double. Even I even speak it today, that you would speak to people during the message to, to will come on the side of what God is doing here and rally to bring this vision to pass, to be instruments and tools in your hand. In Jesus' name, we thank you and give you the glory. And everybody said, amen. amen. Mark chapter 2. I'm in my old King James. I had this since I was 13, and I got all the duct tape to prove it. I went from the silver, they came out with blue. That's even better. Now I can preach at the, a wealthy church, and they don't judge me because I've added the blue to the... Anyway, no, I can't get rid of this. Part of it's fallen out, but... Uh, I just, uh, all the memories, it's preached in 30-some states, a few thousand sermons anyway. But in Mark 2, I'm in the old King James because that's what comes back to my memory when I'm thinking of Scripture. It says, and again, Jesus entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. <clears throat> if we keep Jesus in the house, we can go from a white inflatable sanctuary to a brand new, I'll just say to make it easy on you if you're a guest, over a $100,000 sanctuary out back. If Jesus is in the house, programs and activities and gift giving and all the rest, you know, we, we, you know, use the tools he's given us. But if Jesus is in the house, you wind up with around 3,000 people in a matter of how many years? don't know. It's been so long. Well, you, you wouldn't know anyway. You're the guy saying our uniforms just dropped right off us. It was amazing. <laughs> we literally did have a couple of leather helmets still, and we should have saved them. Those are worth probably 300 bucks a piece anyway. So Jesus was in the house, and word got out. How many of you came to harvest time because you had a need in your life, and somebody told you that Jesus would touch your life when you got here? Hmm? When Jesus is in the house, you don't need coercing or convincing. When the presence of God, do you feel what I'm feeling right now? When Jesus is in the house, it doesn't matter. Something's going to happen. And so they, they uh, verse 2, straightway, many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy. He couldn't walk. So he was born of four men. And when they could not come near him for the press, for the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, if you're here today in this roof opens up and they start lowering somebody in, that's an evidence of faith. Now, I don't suggest it. We got enough remodeling fees to raise to get this completed, but Jesus saw their faith. They didn't, they didn't come to the door and say, well, you know, we're bringing our buddy in here, Joe. Okay, Joe. Yeah, it looks kind of yeah, no, I'm sorry, bud. We, there's four of us here. We dragged you like five miles from your house, but I know you need a healing, but it's, uh, it's like wall to wall. It's packed, and he's teaching. I don't want to interrupt anything. You can't even get in. There's no greeters. There's nothing. It's just like, I don't even know what we're... That didn't stop them. We're going to come back to that. They came in. They came in. They didn't come in for any other house. They came in because Jesus was in the house. They came in there. And when they couldn't get in there, they didn't take no for an answer. They did not care that you could barely see him. You could barely hear him. No sound system, nothing. No cordless mics. He's just preaching and lives are being touched. 
read between the lines. We, the Bible doesn't tell us everything that's going on every second in the life of Jesus. Something's happening that is holding a crowd that's standing room only. There's an anointing. There's a presence. There's a recognition by at least some that this is the Son of God. Didn't have to explain anything. They knew Jesus was there. They pressed through, couldn't get in, said, I got another idea. And they had enough faith that the four of them agreed and took their friend to the roof, tore the roof off, knowing they would have to deal with that later, and they lowered him in. Come on. Is anybody catching this already? I'm already preaching. When he saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, does this make sense? Well, he's demonstrating something. He's sick, and they're lowering him in, and he's saying, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. They were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. By the way, in 40 years of preaching, Pastor, it's been the religious crowd that's given me my most trouble. And I can't camp on this thought right now. I'm more comfortable with bikers. I really am. I gave out biker Bibles one summer. In our, we had two churches going, and we did three free meals a day in Bike Week in Meredith, New Hampshire. Our main church was an hour and a half away in Berwick. We'd commute every day, but we, did, we put a big tent up. Three free meals a day. I had a Harley Road King that year. I shaved my head and... I'm just going to say it. I don't want to get in trouble. That summer and that summer only, I wore a cross earring because I, my goal with my wife was I wanted to give out 100 biker Bibles and I wanted to lead 10 people to Christ myself. I'd been in ministry, I think at that point, 25 years because it was our anniversary. And I said, I wanted to be, it's symbolic. There's no theological basis for it. And I hope I don't get in trouble, but I said, I want to be symbolic of a love slave this summer. Would put their door, their ear to the doorpost and running all through it. I put a cross nearing in because it would be a conversation starter. And I was a missionary to bikers that summer. And, and so we would be there and, and I do better with the F-bombs <laughs> from police work and dealing with bikers and everything else. I'm not for that, and I don't talk that. I don't mean I do better with, no, I mean, you know what I'm saying. See, somebody's out there thinking, he's going down, he's crashing. He doesn't realize it. Eject the plane, eject the plane, emergency. Anyway, I do better just being a guy, and so Jesus himself is having trouble with the religious crowds. Well, doesn't it say, well, what do you mean? You are saying that... You're forgiving sins. What manner of blasphemy is this? You're forgi- and Jesus said, I, I, what's harder to say? What's easier to say? What's harder? What's easier? Thy sins be forgiven thee, or take up thy bed and walk. And while they're sitting there taking notes on a clipboard, looking down over their glasses, he says, take up your bed and walk. And the guy who has not walked. Woo! And then he said, wait, he said, take up my bed too. So he grabbed his bed and he exited. Think of it. He didn't need any business cards, folks. I've printed up so many business cards before. You find them years later in your desk. Remember we did that? Yeah, never did. He didn't need a business card. He was just the son of God. He just did it. And so, so here he is. He said, Arise and take up thy bed, verse 11, and go thy way into thine house. Verse 12, And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. That's what the King James says. We never saw it on this fashion. Anybody here have a calendar on you? Paper calendar. Huh? Can I see it, Jim? No? Oh, you have one at home. Oh, I'm not going to throw your phone. You got a calendar? Can I throw that? Is that all right? Can you turn me to January? Here we go. So we're flipping pages. Wait, is that a grocery list? No, just kidding. Here we go, Rachel. That's July. Wait, wait, wait. I'm 
Oh, that's 2017. That's a 1968. She's way behind. No, just kidding. Where am I? Can I have December 17, 2017? All right, let's go to December. Thank you. We're going to go backwards. No, just kidding. Thank you. Thank you. I'll send you a check in the mail. Just kidding. Uh, December 2017. How many of us close out a year and we think, I mean, like, with two weeks left, I'm thinking, man, I want to make 2017 count. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's pretty well done. I mean, wow. December 31st, I'm thinking, I got to get that weight off. I got like four hours left. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> huh? You know what I'm saying? Well, we got through Thanksgiving and Christmas, but I'm telling you, baby, Monday morning after Christmas, I'm starting a diet. I'm going to get one of them down Maine diets going. I'm going to have porky pine, chipmunk, and no, just kidding. Anyway, I'm from Maine. I can tease. But you're saying, man, I think I can get all this off. I said that to my wife last night. I've gained 15 pounds since Thanksgiving. I still got 35 off, though. I got to focus on that. So we're trying to focus. And Father, right now, forgive Pastor Faith for bringing in those amazing crullers that were deep fried with a crisp sugar. And, and then the bagels, too, were awesome. And that corn muffin? Ooh, anyway. Anyway. So I told my wife last night, honey, I got to get this weight back off by the end of the month, you know? Anybody struggle besides me? Come on. And so I just love to eat. Anyway, come to the altar right now. We'll pray. So we think, you know what, though? Boy, here it is. That was a, wasn't that a Sunday night, the 31st? So, man, Monday the 1st, I'm turning the page. And how many years? I'm 59. I've turned the page from one year to the next 45 million times. You know what I'm saying? We were at my daughter's two days ago, and she was talking about our grandson, and he is 18 months. So I said, honey, how many months am I? And she put me in. She said, dad, you're 710 months. I feel younger. I'm just months. 710 months. So I've turned a few calendars. And sometimes we can fall in the trap of thinking, it's just another year. It's not just another year. We got to rip the roof off. He said, we never saw it on this fashion. 2018 is going to be different. I believe it. When your pastor prayed for us in this office this morning around 830, he prayed a prayer that aligns with exactly some notes I had put in my Bible literally yesterday. He said some of the same things. Something is releasing. Something is going to be different. This is a year of breakthrough. We've just had, yes, it's okay to say amen if you believe it. And everybody says it every year. This is your year. Hey, I'm still saying it. And if God called me home right now, why live the other way? Well, we've tried before. It's not going to work. Never mind. No. Where does that get us? Why not believe that our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think? Why not ask him to heal your bride or your groom? Why not ask him to deliver? I told a man in my church years ago, I, I, he was working on my postal Jeep. I had an old postal Jeep that I camoed up and I used it running around the woods hunting and all that fishing and I pull up he's working on the hood the hood's up and he saw pastors coming he was new to my church and he dropped his cigarette like he didn't want me to see his cigarette I said Roland what are you doing man I said don't work on my jeep that has gas leaks and you're smoking a cigarette and certainly don't hide it by putting your your butt under the under the hood I mean his cigarette butt under the hood and <laughs> We, gotta, we need like the time delay on this show today. I, he said, well, Pastor, I, know, I said, well, I know you're struggling with smoking, but let me tell you something. One of these cigarettes is going to be your last. And now it's been about 25 years later. I talked to him about a month ago, visited his home. He's never smoked since. And he didn't stop till he was in his 40s. This is a different year, folks. This is a year to beat addictions. Things like pornography. 
Now, that never happens in Connecticut. <laughs> this is a year to cut out some channels off your TV because you fall every time you get them free. Amen. Am I okay? Is this safe? Maybe this should be men's meeting Monday night. I don't know. But it's not just men. We're being bombarded in every direction. If you think, well, that's just the way I am. No, it isn't. You're clean and free in Christ, and you're going to change. You're going to get eyes for your own bride. You're going to stop doing the things you shouldn't do. You're, you're one of these days. Somebody, I believe, Pastor, came here today, and they are struggling with lighting up. <laughs> and it could be not just a regular cigarette. It might have that little rolled up thing tucked in the pack so the police won't find it and all that. Like the guy at the car wash the other day on my truck and he was cleaning something and he, his cigarettes fell out and out came a couple other things and I said, you know I'm a pastor and you know I'm an ex-cop and I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to forget about the special cigarettes that just fell out of your pocket. Oh no, there aren't any. I said, yeah, right, okay, but I'm praying for you and I left it at that. Come on. Somebody's here today that is going to leave and never touch another one in the name of Jesus. Listen, we've got to rip the roof off. Three things quickly, quickly. Number one, we've got to rip the roof off our past. 2018 is not 2017. And I don't care if last year was the worst year of your life. This is going to be the best year of your life through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's time to get up again. It's time to stay up again. It's time to start stumbling, stop struggling, stop failing. It's a new year. It's a new day. This is the first Sunday morning of 2018. And we have a responsibility to the all-powerful, all-knowing God who is all-enabling. And we have a responsibility not to live with our heads down and in the dirt and in the dark. We have a responsibility to get up in the name of Jesus and let him change us by the grace of God. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, you hath he quickened. And yet some of us are walking around all, we're not a testimony of the quickening power of God. If all we are is discouraged and depressed and crawling around whining and complaining and gossiping and bad words coming out of our mouth. Well, this is good preaching. I got I to gotta hurry up. Listen, we are not who they said we were. We are not who your third grade teacher said you were. You're not who your first pastor said you were. You're not who your first boss said you were. Some of you are changing. Come on. God can break you free. If you want a great testimony of the victorious power of God to completely change your life and bring it into a place of success, why don't you just read Pastor, uh, Brother H Chef Julio Rubio's book. Brother Julio, can you just wave? You guys must know him by now, you know? Glenn, Pastor, one of the only books, I've read about three books in my life, didn't matter the length, in one setting. His was one of them. You're walking to the bridge that day and God interrupted it. <laughs> Look where you are, all styling back there with beautiful mama and a son. Come on. And kids, man. And your book. Can you say amen, Brother Julio? Chef, can you wave? Look what the Lord has done in the name of Jesus. If he had failed to rip the roof off his past, he'd still be there. Listen, quickly. I got like four minutes. Listen, rip the roof off your present. <clears throat> Don't say uh, with your past, well, that's how it's always going to be. No, it isn't. I, I'm a little boy who at age five, my daddy left. My dad was an abusive alcoholic, and I've told this story before. Years later, I led him to Christ. 
and he'd bring up his past and say, I'm sorry for what I did. What do you mean, Dad? Well, I left you and your mom and your sister, and I didn't send support, and I moved to Cal- I said, don't know what you're talking about. He looked at me like, what are you talking about, son? I said, because you accepted Christ as your Savior, and that's not you and I. We're father, son. That won't change, and everything's fine in my book, so why don't you leave yourself alone? That was 40-some years ago, Dad. And he's with Jesus today. And the last few years of my dad's and stepmom's lives and my mom and stepdad that I was raised by, all four of them attended my church. (laughs) Hallelujah. And there wasn't one fist fight. Not even an argument. Come on. So don't be stuck with your past and rip the roof off your present. They wanted to get him to Jesus They did not let that roof of their present circumstances get them in the way. How many people make a start and then quit? These folks were so intense. They said, we're not taking no for an answer. We're going up to the roof and we'll rip this stinking roof off if we have to. And we'll lower him in because Jesus is in the house and there's about to be a miraculous change. And it worked in Jesus' name. Our present can get in the way if we allow it. What the doctor said can get in the way if we allow it. Listen, I figured it out according to scripture. He already knows the date on my tombstone, even though I don't have a tombstone yet. He knows the date of our birth. He knows the date of our death. We're not getting out of here alive, but it's okay because we're not leaving until he says, come on, buddy. Come on, daughter. Come on, son. Until then, don't lose one minute of sleep. And don't let whatever the doctor says terrorize you and make you go home and sit in a recliner waiting for Jesus to come. Stay active. Stay going. If you got a problem, start eating healthier. Start exercising. Say, Because if I go, I'm going down with a fight. I'm not going to go down sitting there all depressed, discouraged, and terrified. In the name of Jesus, whatever my present is, that roof is in the way. I'm going to rip the roof off my present. I'm going to be like Abraham in Romans 4. It says he staggered not at the promises of God. I refuse to base my future on what my past was in that calendar and even what my present is. I believe in 40 years of marriage and 40 years of ministry, this is going to be our greatest season ever. We've had enough tough seasons. Come on. How many of you would stand and say, you're going forward. God is going to accomplish it for the glory of God in Jesus name. I refuse to base my future on what is. I refuse. I'm going to ask, seek, knock, reach, stretch, believe. I'm going to keep on asking and seeking. I'm going to walk right. I'm starting every day on my knees. I'm ending every night with prayer and I'm going to talk to him all day long. Because I'm not going to go on like it is. Because my God is a living, vibrant God. And he has something bigger and better. In Jesus' name. I want to walk in my destiny. I built enough farm tables and remodeled antiques and haul loads. And I love to do it and I'll still do it. But as we did it, we've often said, this is not our call and our gift. It's paying the bills. And each year it's gotten a little better. And we've done it a little for 40 years now. But, but something's, Pastor, something, something's happening with this year. Something is happening. And I believe by the next time I come to preach, something is going to happen. And I'm going to give testimony to God. I don't know what it is, but I feel it like never in my life. I've heard people say, you're too old. I've had two different pastors. You'd know one of them. Tell me, well, you're getting old, Al. I'm not old. I'm 59. I'll I'll take you on right here on this floor. You know what I mean? (laughs) This guy was a little older than me, maybe two or three years. I wanted to say, you come out in the parking lot, buddy. I'm not old. And he said, well, maybe you should just blend in somewhere. I said, I have a heart to plant a church. In fact, I'm going to lay this all out here. I would love to plant 12 more churches in my life. I'd love to. Whether I do or not is up to God, but it's not going to be because it's not going to not happen because I'm sitting in my recliner. 
in the name of Jesus. I'm ripping the roof off my present. My present is not going to dictate what God wants to do yet. What started here at harvest time, I'm down to zero minutes, okay? <laughs> Listen, what started here on a napkin or a scratch pad and then evolved. Where did you guys meet first? I'm trying to remember. Was it Stan? You met in a gym. And then once, when we first got here, you still had the wonderful white igloo out here, the inflatable thing, that every time somebody coughed, it would blow across the parking lot. You know, how would that be right now in these winds that we've had? Especially if you had church, you guys would all thought you're going up to be with Jesus. That thing would have been on one of the YouTube videos features this week. And then you get this great sanctuary and great Sunday school rooms and Wonderful kitchen with beautiful coffee. Thank you, Pastor Faith. I'll forgive the donuts because the coffee is helping me today. Listen, and about three years ago, we come in, there's a hole out back. And the hole tells me something. That we, and, and I'm interjecting my wife and I because we feel like family and part of this team here. We are not going to sit here and be content with this wonderful sanctuary because there aren't many more seats right now in the second service, and we're doing three services now, and there's a couple more people I'd like to see come to Jesus. Somebody's uncle, somebody's aunt, somebody's ex-wife, somebody's child, somebody's mom, somebody's dad, and so we're ripping the roof off the future. And for three years, I've been watching a hole turn into one of the nicest sanctuaries I've ever seen in my life all over the country, and we're not going to be content. And I know how it is because I pastored. I've been in ministry over 40 years. And oh, he's taking up another offering. Now, none of you said that, but maybe people driving by. Well, when are they going to think it's good enough, you know? I had a lady once in my first church say, Pastor, why are we expanding? Why don't people just learn to come early to get a seat? I wanted to say I was respectful. She was older than me, about 100 years older. And I... I wanted to say, oh, precious sister, do the math. What if you're the one that gets here late? I didn't. I kicked her out. No, I didn't. I let it go. Listen, what a mentality. Let's not allow any more members. I say we take another half a million this month. Get them in here in Jesus' name. And we've got to rip the roof off the future. I know it can be scary. Uncertainty has stopped a lot of people. Fear of the unknown test results and threats and issues and incidents that'll probably never happen. I'm a little crazy anyway. I had a guy when I was a police officer arrested him one night and I'm taking him to jail. He's cursing me. He's yelling, screaming. He's saying he's going to come kill me and all that. I said, yeah, I'll tell you my address. We lived at 120 Wentworth Road then. I didn't tell my wife and kids, but I told him where we live. If you want to come, come on in. I'd get to the jail. I was a municipal officer. I'd get to the jail where I was also a chaplain and sworn deputy. I couldn't tell a guy that was violent that I was also a pastor and pray for him. But when I get to the jail, the guards would say, hey, the reverend's here tonight. I'm bringing in a prisoner. And I've been good to him because that could be me or my son or my daughter or my wife or anybody. They just had a bad night, I'd get there and the guards would say, the reverend's here. And the guy would say, oh, I just cursed out a reverend. And I would say, it's okay, but if you want help with this drug problem, I can point you to several. And it would open it up because I didn't bring it up. So la-di-da, I could share the gospel. <laughs> As the arresting officer, and I was so gentle anyway, I had him thank me. I had, I had a guy thank me. He said, oh, thank you. I I've stopped drinking. I saw him months later. I have stopped drinking because you arrested me that night for drunk driving. I'm alive. And I'm saying, yeah, we got through to one person. Come on. Listen, listen, we got to wind down and rip it off. Decide what's in your way. How many of you in this message have already learned some things that are in your way? You know, no one has to tell you. I got to say it again. It could be a TV channel. It could be a TV channel. How do you know that? Come on, this is a real world. Come on. It could be a relationship with a friend, a Facebook friend, who's married and you're not. How many situations have we unscrambled because they decided to go skiing together one time because the other spouses didn't like it? 
Come on. Decide what's in your way and drop the defeated talk. John 3, 17 says he sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved. Speak life and get up and get up and get up. And the last thing is this, quickly. Listen, the last thing is you've got to find friends and you will find them in this church. I issue no disclaimers. I can say with confidence, you're going to find a pastor and an associate pastoral team and a ministry team and a worship team. I'm telling you that you're going to be safe with and they will carry you to where you need to go. They will carry you in worship. They will carry you in prayer. They will carry you through these classes from the Alpha Course, the men's ministry, the ladies' ministry, the children's ministry, the teen ministry. They are going to carry you. And if you're starting to walk a wrong path, you need friends that will surround you and rip the roof off your past, your present, and your future. Only friends can take you higher sometimes because you and I get paralyzed. Not just any friends, but loyal friends. Friends who understand you, who get you, who pray for you. I like what Tommy Barnett says, don't don't pray for me if you can't fight for me. Friends that'll fight for you and pray for you. Who believe in you. I'm sure of this. Your pastor and Pastor Nick believe more in my wife and I than we did at times the last three years. I feel okay today, but I'll never forget the first introduction by this guy, doctor. He's calling me doctor. I I handed him 20 bucks when he gave me the mic for calling me doctor in honor, and I felt pretty low, pastor. Everything I ever built closed. And I was broke. I was making 10 grand that year. I made 10 grand and we still made it. And our credit score is still over 800 because God kept us. And, and we had the best year. But it was friends like that. And this is a great church. Pretty decent place to say that I was asked to preach here by a friend. And so many of you become friends. And this old guy is not old. And if you, if you want to challenge me, Jim will fight you. I, I know our time is out. I know it's out. But I love you guys. There's so much hope and potential. There's such a great future. You guys opened that up incomplete. Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, there was standing room only. We wanted to come, but we couldn't. We were in the middle of a house closing. And we saw those pictures. I don't know, look at this. You watch what God's going to do. Father, in Jesus' name, I, I, just raise your hands if this message was for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I rebuke any hindrance, any obstacle past, present, or future. We release this to you. We release each individual to you, every marriage to you, every relationship to you. This whole team, this worship team, these pastoral team, God, you just do it. This is the year. It's an unusual year, and we trust you. You are going to rip the roof off, and you're going to use us in Jesus' name. Amen.